Well, good morning and welcome. Um, I hope your summer is going well. For us here in the inland northwest, we're having unseasonably warm weather. And uh, a lot of people don't like it, uh, particularly if you don't have air conditioning. What I find kind of interesting is because there are those who say, well, see, this is evidence of global warming, which is uh, would make sense if you only uh, if the planet only existed for the last hundred years. Uh, in fact, we had similar temperatures in our area uh, just a little over a hundred years ago or a little less than 100 years ago. And what I think is interesting, I was reading an archeological a magazine the other day where they were talking about between the fourth and the second century before Christ, uh, the entire coastline of Israel, uh, particularly around a city that was called Dor, lost its harbor because of the rising of sea levels. In fact, the sea level rose about seven feet high um, and it wiped out the whole uh, coastline as far as being able to have have harbors that were usable. Um, that's why, in fact, Herod the Great uh, built the city of Caesarea Maritima, this huge man-made harbor, because as Josephus says, tells us there were no harbors anywhere else along the coastline. So uh, there again, we have historical precedences of these kind of swings of temperature and stuff. But for those of you who might wonder, is this a, a sign of something? I will admit, though, that the Bible does tell us that in the end times, there will be tremendous global warming, the climate will change very dramatically, and it says that men's tongues will swell in their mouth and they'll scorch their skin and they'll curse God for the heat that they can't escape. Um, so, you know, it, there may be an argument for that, but hopefully that's not what we're experiencing at this point. But uh, I really don't want to dwell too long on that. I just kind of came to my mind to speak to that. But what we're doing is uh, continuing our day-to-day -day devotional studies in the gospel of, or excuse me, the letter of James. And uh, we're in at the end of chapter four, really, the beginning of chapter uh, five, and uh, some of you who have been following may say, well, didn't we finish chapter four last, last week? And my answer is, well, not completely, because the very last verse of chapter four is verse 17, where it says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do but doesn't do it is in sin. Uh, it's interesting because we find this is really uh, a little bit removed from what he has been saying up to that point, other than the fact that all of these issues that he talk about are issues that are sin challenges in our life. But one of the things I think we need to understand when we read the scriptures is that the division of the Bible into the chapters and verses as we have them today was really something that got started around the fourth century. In fact, it was in the fourth century that the first Greek text had paragraphs. I mean, prior to that, um, there were just basically consonants uh, that were strung together and you had to vocalize what you were reading to be able to distinguish where the words began and end. There were no periods, there were no, no quotation marks. There's none of those designations, even none of the jots and tittles that Jesus refers to in the Hebrew text. So basically, uh, those divisions are kind of are somewhat arbitrary. Sometimes they do a good job of capturing the change uh, in the message or the action, but sometimes you need to read the beginning of another chapter in order to get the entire story. Uh, really, it was in the fifth century that uh, Jerome, the famous translator who translated the Greek and Hebrew text into the Latin Vulgate, which is was the, cop, the version that was used by the Catholic Church for many centuries, but he just divided them into what called short, short pericopes. In other words, he took uh, basically would take the parable of the sower and separate it out from what came before and what followed after. It wasn't until actually 1227, a guy by the name of Stephen Langston, or uh, Stephen, uh, yeah, Stephen Langston, but basically who divided the Bible into chapters as we know that. And then again in 1551, a, a guy by the name of Robert Stephanus, he was a French printer. He began to divide the text uh, in the into the verses as we know it today so that it wasn't really until four years after that, in 1555, that the first entire Bible was divided into chapters and verses as we know them today. And um, 
it's uh, actually 1565 years later that the first English Bible to have both chapter and verse division, the Old and New Testament, was the Geneva Bible, which I happen to have a 1601 uh, version or a copy of, of one of my most prized possessions. But I say that because with the verses and chapters are extremely helpful in, in reading the text and following and keeping track and, and indexing what you want to look for, but uh, they themselves are not part of the original sacred text. So if you come to the end of the chapter and it doesn't seem to make sense, that's the reason why. But what I want to talk about is this particular statement that is made by the, 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 by the uh, John, James when he says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And I'm going to expand this this week into the broader issue of one specific area of sin or potential sin, and that's the how we deal with money. Uh, essentially, we can ask the question, is sin actually, or is money actually sinful? But one of the things that, that we understand is that every one of us is created with a awareness of, of the basic concept of morality. And it's a dichotomous concept. In other words, uh, morals are divided. There's a good side and there's an evil side. There's truth. There's falsehood. Uh, there's love. There's hate. There's reality. There's fantasy or fiction. Um, Everything in life has to be divided in some way or else we could make no sense of life. And it's interesting because there is this argument from uh, modern psychiatry that there is no such thing as uh, evil, that evil is a religious concept and that therefore it, it shouldn't be used in trying to understand people's behavior. And I heard this being discussed in terms of addressing the issues of why serial killers do what they do. And the only thought that came to my mind is it's easy to say that a serial killer, what he's doing isn't evil, it's a brain malfunction. But the problem is it's very evil in terms of the victims who become uh, preyed upon by these individuals. So I think it's, it's really kind of a a silly distinction that you have to live in an ivory tower disconnected from the real pain and hardship of people's day-to-day -day life. And when we talk about morality, it really comes down to making choices. That's the idea of this uh, bifurcation or dichotomous assessment of good and evil, that I realize that God has given to me a choice. I can choose to do something that is good as opposed to something that is evil. And I also can choose to do evil. That's why I think that Dr. Wilders Alfred Wildersmith once said that the God's great gamble was that he gave man a free sovereign will that we simply have the capacity to say no to God. So the bigger question we have to deal with in our life is, to what degree are we open to saying yes to God? And what happens when we say no to God? And essentially what James is saying is, when I know I should say yes to God and I say no, and I said, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm not going to let God tell me what to do, then that is what the Bible calls sin. And sin always is evil in that it leads to evil consequences. So what is the opposite of evil? Good. So if I want good things to happen in my life, I'm going to be saying yes to God. And if I want evil things to happen in my life, I'm going to say no to God. And that's really the, the central paradigm that all human lives revolve around then morality comes down to the choices that we make to whether listen to God or to reject God. Um, and essentially, when I say yes to God, I'm seeking to draw closer to him in a more intimate way because I'm choosing him as opposed to something that would take me away from him. So when God describes himself in, in Exodus 20 as being a jealous God, his jealousy isn't like human jealousy that simply wants to consume some object or some person for their own selfish satisfaction. God is jealous over us because he loves us and he hates to see us suffer. And that's the attitude that we should take not only towards ourselves but towards other people that we see making evil choices that essentially what they're going to do is harm themselves by their choices. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. So I'm not surprised all the time when I hear of young people saying we're going to live together before marriage. Even Christian couples, this is becoming increasingly popular. They say they're Christians and yet they violate God's word because they're in love. And there's no way that that can turn out well. Because if you sow to the fleshly nature, the human nature, the sinful nature, all that can come out is corruption. I mean, it's kind of like making sausage. If you take meat, chop it up, and put it inside a sausage grinder, it comes out the other side. It's not going to come out as filet mignon. It's going to be sausage. 
And I think that that's what, even if you put filet mignon in in the first place, in fact, it reminds me, my wife bought some hamburgers for her. She said they were made from tri-tip. Tip. And I was thinking to myself, you took good tri-tip and you ground it to make it into hamburger? Well, anyway, that's my issue. But nonetheless, we have to understand that no matter if we put wrong choices into our life, what will come out after it's ground up is something that we're not going to want to live with or eat or be part of. Uh, serve the Lord, seek his face, choose that which is right and good in his sight. And Lord willing, we'll pick this up tomorrow.